Hello, everybody. This is Adrian Kerr. Welcome to my next installment of Adventures with Adrian. Today, we're going to address in two parts the fascinating subject of technological advances that made our world. So off we go with part one. Many people ask themselves, well, what was the first invention or technological advance that actually brought uh, change to civilization? Um, and uh, taking lots of advice and studying this for ma many years, um, I think most people would say the first major step forward in civilization was the control of fire. Of course, you and I both know that the um, appearance of fire um, was random, caused by lightning in trees, and you could take uh, fire from that and keep it going, but occasionally it would go out. So the trick was uh, to actually control this fire and have fire when you wanted it. That's the big step forward. If we go back to around two million years ago, we'll see that people were already using heat to make the um, food that they ate more palatable and easy to digest. Um, and if you um, go to places in Thailand today, you'll find hot springs up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit, where people will skewer their meat and put it in the hot springs and effectively boil the food free of charge. And that was probably one of the earliest uses of heat to make food more palatable. We have to give credit to this gentleman, Homo erectus, who lived uh, just younger than two million years ago, but lasted for a very long time indeed, as far as 300,000 um, years ago. He was very different from his predecessors because of his brain. His brain was 50% larger than his predecessors, and that gave him the ability to think and analyze. And he was the person that we give credit to for controlling fire about a million years ago. Um, of course, fire is really handy for a number of purposes. Uh, it provides warmth if you're living in caves. It protects you from predators who roam at night. Um, it also allows you to make harder spear points by putting the wooden spear into the fire for a short while to harden the wood, which means it penetrates animal skins more readily. But the hidden advantage of cooking, apart from the tasting better, was hot food, cooked food, actually digests more easily in human stomachs. And therefore, the amount of energy we used to digest food became less. So it's a double benefit. Tastes better and also... Um, doesn't use as much energy to consume. The um, anthropologists also believe strongly that this constant um, availability of fire meant that instead of going to bed at uh, dark and then sleeping until dawn because it's too dangerous to go outside um, and you couldn't see each other until fire was developed and then you could have um, fires in the caves and that would allow you to sit up longer and talk. And this process of talking amongst family members and clan members meant that we were able to focus our brain for the first time in, in, um, in humanity's history on this planet into thinking forward, analyzing and planning. Um, and they began to alter our brain capacity. Um, our memories got better, our problem solving um, skills got better, and we're able to plan the day ahead so that the whole uh, family could get involved in the hunt. So not just uh, better food, easier to uh, digest, but also a complete change in how humans conduct themselves during the dark hours. The next step, of course, after harnessing fire was the development of tools. The very earliest surviving tool that we know on the planet comes from around about two and a half million years ago in Northeast Africa in a state we call Ethiopia today. And this is an example of what was um, to been discovered. And it's a very crude tool indeed. It's a boulder with a sharpened edge, but that was very helpful in actually cutting meat and stripping um, fat and tissue and hair from um, skins, which allowed them to be made into clothes. It was a long time to come before the next major step forward in tools came, which was about a million years later. Uh, and this was around about 1.5 million years ago when these very sharpened tools appeared. Now these are a big step forward. And by uh, cutting flint with another stone and uh, flaking it, you could produce uh, uh, two edges, which were sharp um, and a point that could penetrate animal skin so much better than a wooden point. And so we start to see spears being produced with stone um, ends and then bound to the wooden spears with leather thongs. 
And then we also began to see hand axes, um, same application, but for breaking up food and killing animals in close quarters. So that was a development of tools and they got ever sharper and lighter and more advanced as time went on. But of course, the really big step forward in tool um, use was in the uh, Industrial Revolution um, from the 1700s onwards. The need to manufacture goods in factories meant that we needed to have equipment to assemble those uh, machines and also repair them. So standardized machine tools uh, began to appear high quality. Um, and this was kickstarted the Industrial Revolution. And of course, tools today are an essential part of manufacture. And most of us have a fine array of tools for car work in our garages. The next big step forward was the wheel. In this picture, I show obviously a wheel for a cart. But in fact, the first wheel that we know of on this planet um, was for use in making pots. Um, and so around about 4,500 BC, that's over 6,000 years ago, potters throughout the world were making their pots on circular discs, which they actually powered um, by foot treadle. And this was the first use of a potter's wheel. The big step forward though, to using it for transport came a thousand years later. And on the right hand side, you can see the first surviving image of a cart. Um, this was a very crude cart indeed. It had two axles, it had solid wooden wheels, and uh, it first appeared in East Europe around about 3500 BC. It was turned into a weapon of war by the, um, the people of Ur in Iraq near Baghdad today, and this was found in a chest which had the king's um, clothes. And it's a beautiful piece and it survived all these years. And it shows on one side of the chest, um, warfare and the other side of the chest peaceful activities and this one of course i picked out because it shows the earliest indication of a war chariot now of course these were pulled by donkeys because horses took a long long longer to um, bring into the middle east um, from the steps um, and you can see how clumsy and heavy this this would have been the big step forward over the next thousand years was the development of the harnessing of horses in the Middle East, meant allowed the uh, chariots to go faster, and also you're able to um, turn more quickly. And the wheels were, instead of solid wood, were actually spindle wheels, um, which were lighter, but of course, occasionally broke. But this would be a fast chariot. The axles are moved back, so center of gravity was forward, so it could turn very quickly and come back for another pass. And this was the preferred weapon of war uh, until cavalry was um, became common during the late Roman times, a uh, thousand years later. The compass completely overlooked these days. We take them for granted, but this was a huge step forward in civilization. <coughs> The earliest use of the properties of magnetic ore was in China around about 2000 years ago when this naturally occurring magnetic iron ore or lodestone as it's called um, was able to indicate a direction of true north and you can see this picture I'm showing is a naturally occurring magnetic iron lodestone and it's attracting a paperclip. Now, if you actually have that paper clip suspended on the lodestone, then as you move in directional terms, the needle um, will actually uh, keep pointing to magnetic north. So you always have an idea of which way you're traveling, north, south, east, or west. This was a massive step forward for the Vikings because all of a sudden with modern technological design of uh, masts and sails and shallow ships, but were still seagoing, they could move out of their homeland in Scandinavia as this map showed. And from around 900 AD till about 1200 AD, they were the dominant mariners in not only Northwest Europe, but also the Mediterranean. And you can see how they took advantage of their technology with regard to ships. They moved down the Russian rivers and they became known as the rowers, which in Viking was Rus, hence they formed the Rus states, which gave the name to Russia. Further west, they moved uh, to settle in Normandy based on the fact that they were Norman, Norman people, Norsemen. Um, and they also settled in York, which was an old Roman town, and they took northern Scotland and they settled a, an area which we now call Dublin around 795. So they weren't just raiders, they were also 
um, come, they came to farm and they eventually, the, Nor the Norwegian version of the Vikings, moved northwards to the Shetlands, the Faroe Islands, and then they colonized Iceland, and then they further went on to Greenland in two uh, civilized areas, around about a thousand, and uh, then they finally made it to Newfoundland around the same time. And of course, that's a great debating point is, did they ever get any further into mainland, mainland uh, United States? Of course, uh, those are very crude compasses and uh, the need for more accurate navigation in the um, 1700s and later led to a drive to find uh, higher quality magnetic compasses uh, that were more sensitive and more lightweight and more robust. Um, and that allowed the whole of the world um, by the time of Thomas Cook to be circumnavigated quite safely. And Magellan, as we know, shortly after Christopher Columbus discovered the New World, did manage to tour around the whole world. Although, of course, uh, although we tend to think he was the first circumnavigator, he was actually killed by uh, natives in the Philippines and never, never made it back to Europe. Of course, Compasses now are commonplace and almost all of our cars will have a compass showing the direction we're going, but as the questionnaires have shown that we hardly ever use the compasses and we don't really follow the concepts of north, south, east and west, we use just maps instead. Concrete, and this is a picture of the inside of a pagan temple, which then became a church, which was called the Pantheon in Roman times. It's a unique structure and it survived all these years. The concept of making concrete depends on three ingredients. You need sand and aggregate. You need to have um, a fluid material which you can mix with water and then it will set. We call that material uh, cement. Uh, as long as it sets and hardens, this is a very good building material. We first started to see the use of um, concrete uh, as early as Egyptian times. They found that if they took limestone, which is calcium carbonate, and burnt it in a flame, it would break down um, and you could mix it with other components to make a, a liquid uh, material, which you could then apply to structures to give them strength. And they used them from uh, the Middle Kingdom onwards to coat the outside of their mud brick forts and palaces. By 500 BC, the Greeks were using it more extensively um, to combine uh, rubble together to build walls and then to have concrete floors, which were much uh, better than having uh, mud floors, which allowed water to seep upwards. And they also built underground cisterns, which were lined with concrete. Um, but the finest building in ancient times, which dates back to just before 200 AD, is, is the Pantheon in Rome. And you can see it's a unique design. Uh, they're experimenting here. This is a brand new concept of a circular building, as you can see, and the top of the circular walls, they said, let's finish it off with a circular dome. And they did it not with any reinforcement, but just with pure concrete. And it's the oldest surviving largest concrete structure in the world. And it can be visited today as a huge tourist attraction. And one of the interesting things is the a hole in the center called an oculus. And this was to let light into the um, into the building, but also when it rains, it's quite remarkable to watch the rain fall through the oculus and it goes vertically downwards, nicely controlled into a set of gratings and it takes the rainwater away from the floor. Very, very um, imposing design. The problem with building um, structures uh, with using a brick is you get so high and then there's the weight of the brick um, become so great, it's, it, it exceeds the load bearing capacity of the either mud brick um, building or better would be a fired brick building. But even so, the limit was about six stories, at which point uh, the brick started to break down due to stress. We had to wait until the early 19th century before a brand new type of concrete was developed, which is called Portland cement. Um, and it was a mixture of three components, which is still used today. If you buy a bag of cement, it's still fundamentally as it was in the 1820s. It, had, it of course, is based on limestone, which is calcium carbonate, which goes back to Egyptian times, <coughs> but also added in the furnace is aluminum, aluminum silicate, which is better known as clay. And then the magic ingredient is calcium sulfate or gypsum, as we call it, chalk. Mix those together to a high temperature and you have got the basis of modern Portland cement. 
when this became readily available and to sufficiently high quali quality, then people began to think high. So instead of being stuck with six stories, they doubled it to 12 stories. Imagine a building that was twice the height of any other building on the planet. And this was done in Chicago in 1885, and it's described as a skyscraper. People were in awe, and uh, it was the building headquarters of the home insurance company. Sadly, this corner plot was so valuable that it was demolished in 1931, and we have no longer um, ability to see what this wonderful early skyscraper looked like. Um, in parallel to this, work was going on to use concrete because of its strength and durability for roads. And Mr. Bartholomew uh, built the first concrete street um, in West Ohio. And this is a picture I took. You can see that this is um, over 120 years old and it's still going strong. Very durable material indeed. Moving on to gunpowder and guns that follow. Uh, gunpowder is a simple chemical mixture of three relatively common components. Um, we have charcoal, which of course comes from wood. We have sulfur, which can be found in the Earth's crust. But we have a magic ingredient. Typically, 50 to 70% of gunpowder is made up of potassium nitrate. So if you remember that chemical potassium nitrate, um, in the old days, in Chinese times, it was found in the floor of bat caves because uh, bats um, poop out um, and the stuff that it contains in that material is potassium nitrate. The Chinese began to use um, gunpowder not for its obvious use but for medicine um, and uh, they started uh, recording the elixir of immortality around about uh, 500 AD. But this elixir of immortality, which was prescribed to sick people, occasionally caught fire. And they began to think of, maybe we can use gunpowder for other things than pharmaceuticals. And uh, a few hundred years later, the Tang Dynasty in China uh, began the first experiments using gunpowder in an enclosed form. Um, and they used about 50% of potassium nitrate. And by 1044, the formula, which you can see in the top right-hand corner, was well established in China. And the first application of this now standardized gunpowder composition was um, around about 1050, when the first fireworks um, were recorded in China. And they were used, these bottle rockets, as we call them today, uh, were used to frighten away evil spirits on um, auspicious occasions. Then the Chinese began to realize that if you could contain this gunpowder as it burnt, then you could um, keep it in a tube uh, ignite the gunpowder and it would, it would give enough energy to blow out uh, what we call a cannonball. And they used these um, simple cannons to fight the Mongols and that spread to Europe around about the 13th century. Uh, the first battle where um, muskets and grenades uh, were used was the Battle of Mohi in Hungary, 1241. From then onwards, the Europeans realized they had a new terror weapon. Uh, the English chemist Roger Bacon developed the first European formula and it became standardized and by the early 14th century here we have the first European cannon that's been recorded. Uh, the Chinese meanwhile have been developing their weapons and uh, the bottom right hand corner picture shows you a simple hand cannon that uh, uh, soldiers would carry into battle. Um, very heavy, not very accurate, but uh, carried a real punch when that uh, ball came out of the end of the muzzle. Within 60 or 70 years, these simple cannons have been refined to terror weapons and the Hungarians in Europe um, developed the first uh, very, very powerful bronze cannons. Um, they could fire a ball about a three foot diameter um, and that would hit the walls of uh, any um, city and therefore the city of Byzantium, for instance, um, a few years later, which he withstood uh, many, many sieges over a thousand years. The walls were gradually worn down by the Ottoman uh, invaders who used Hungarian cannons. Um, and eventually they broke through the walls and invaded um, Constantinople and captured it and changed its name to Istanbul today. The next step forward is much more peaceful. It's the printing press. Early writing material was papyrus. Papyrus is a uh, willowy um, grass which grows by the rivers and has a triangular structure. 
if you just cut and then sliced the, the, the triangular stem becomes flat and you can actually then lay it across pieces of each other into a crisscross fashion, put stones on top, squeeze the water out, dry it in the sun and you get a writing product. Of course, anybody who's tried to write on papyrus will know that it's undulating, it's not a smooth surface, but it's readily available in ancient Egypt back uh, to 3000 BC. Some of the earliest papyruses have been uh, have kept all these years. Um, so it lasts very long and it's relatively cheap. When Rome took over the uh, country of Egypt around the time of Julius Caesar and um, Cleopatra, um, they saw the advantage of controlling the papyrus trade and they uh, took the papyrus from Egypt and distributed it throughout the Roman Empire. This is often called the first age of literature. To take an example of how expensive these books were, but they're not really books, they're papyrus rolls. A book is, of course, flat uh, and has a spine. And it's often nowadays called a codex. But if we go back to papyrus scrolls, um, the, a, a copy of the Aeneid um, novel by Homer um, would have cost about six months of a laborer's pay. So only the rich and powerful and religious people could afford to have scrolls of papyrus. When Rome fell around the middle of the fifth century AD, then the control of papyrus stopped um, and the export to around Europe particularly um, crashed. And instead the Europeans started to look for another, another material they could actually write on and that they chose a animal skin, which is often called parchment or vellum. So they would take a sheep or a goat, um, they would skin it and then they would use stones or uh, metal scrapers to remove the hair on one side and also remove the fat and tissue on the other side of the skin. And over a period of time and after a period of drying, you could get a, a very flat, relatively speaking, a surface on which to write. Of course, it was many, many, many times more expensive than the cheap papyrus, but it was the best available material for high quality uh, manuscripts. And we start to see now books where you have leaves um, bound together um, as opposed to rolled scrolls. And we start to see the first books of 400 pages or more. Um, in Bruges in Belgium, um, we have a record that it took one year to produce a book of three or 400 pages. And the cost of producing that book based on the vellum or parchment um, was equivalent to the cost of a small house. So we're back to the fact that um, owning a book could only be afforded by the church or by very wealthy individuals indeed. The massive step forward which made the um, writing and reading um, available to the poor um, was again based in China when around about 200 AD at the end of the Han Dynasty, uh, China invented paper. Paper is based on a wooden um, fiber, um, often mulberry, and the Tang Dynasty around 600 AD um, made it so much of this that these flat pieces of paper um, um, were very durable. Some of them have lasted a thousand years or more. And using a wooden block system of carving out the Chinese characters on a wooden block and then using ink to leave that impression on a piece of paper, um, pages became relatively inexpensive and quick to make. Um, and these became known as codexes of books made out of paper. The movement from this area of China into the West occurred because of a very important battle between the people moving from East to West, the Arabs around about 750 AD. And they met the Chinese moving from East to West and uh, the Battle of Talas near Samarkand was a demarcation of the Western extremes of the Chinese empire to this day. When the um, Arab armies raided the defeated um, Chinese uh, baggage train, they noticed a book and they investigated the book and they realized that the paper was made from mulberry pulp fibers shown here on the right hand side. And so it was that the Middle East became the center of world le learning because books were readily available. Now we move on to a combination of developments which we would call the printing press. So I've explained that by 1400, we had all the ingredients of a printing press. We had the ability to, um, to put an image on a piece of paper using a wooden block. We had now fast drying ink. We had high quality, strong paper made out of trees. 
um, and we standardized on using the Latin alphabet. Mr. Gutenberg in Germany was a goldsmith and he thought that the critical um, improvement that had to be made was instead of hand carving a wooden block for each page, which took a long time and needed skill and couldn't be corrected, how about replacing a wooden block with individual metal uh, letters? And if you see on the right hand side, here's a typical layout of a printer where he will have dozens and dozens of different letters and he can assemble those letters to make words, put them together in a frame and bingo, he can then apply a paper and ink and a weight um, and you can print from those uh, lead letters. When that page is finished, when the book is over, you can then uh, take the letters apart, put them back in the collection and start with a new book very, very cheaply. Um, and so the mass production of relatively cheap text was beginning. Um, and from the 1450s onwards, many people jumped on the bandwagon and uh, printing press um, spread throughout Europe. The um, stick in the muds, the wealthy people who had vellum books, um, loved their vellum books because they were done by hand, so many of them, Bibles particularly, um, and uh, they were multicolored. There were different colors of the letters, there are illustrations, uh, there's all sorts of diagrams and lovely artistic flares. And they thought these cheap um, um, books made out of paper from printing press were second rate. So Gutenberg appealed to them by actually hand coloring some of the letters himself and doing some drawings to sell to the nobility. Things really were moving quickly now and uh, one press could produce 2,500 pages a day. They could, pr one printing company could make six books a day which is a lot faster than one book every six months as it used to be. Who gained from this, of course, were the lower middle classes who could now begin to afford books. With the ability to buy books and the desire to learn to read, which is a huge step forward, um, literature became well known. And uh, it's now considered that the printing press accelerated the age of enlightenment, where people for the first time could read books themselves, make their own decisions, they could read the Bible, they could question religion, and that began the birth of Protestantism, and also created uh, a challenging environment under the age of enlightenment, where democracy was debated, higher education was desired, and so the whole of the modern world made a big step forward. Of course, it's all based on the Latin alphabet. And it was many years before the Arabic letters could be condensed to be able to print, print Arab books um, around about 1700. So they were two or 300 years behind Europe at that time. We're moving on to a product which we take for granted today, iron and then steel. The, um, the first use of iron was identified in the Middle East around about uh, 1000 um, um, BC. Um, and uh, we call this the Iron Age. By around about six or 700 BC, um, iron was used for weapons and common to everybody in the Middle East and also many parts of Europe, the Iron Age had come. But it was a thousand years later uh, before the mass production of cheap iron and therefore iron products made from iron um, were developed. And the first was uh, first person to make the breakthrough was Abraham Darby in the Midlands in England, who used coke, a modified form of coal, to heat um, in what he called a blast furnace. And by mixing um, iron ore um, with charcoal and coke, um, he was able to heat it to a high temperature, melt out the iron, and he could produce high quality iron in large volumes. And so it was that this iron could be turned into girders and spars, and so bridges could be constructed. And the first ever iron bridge on the planet was made by Mr. Pritchard, and it covered the Severn River, and it's still there today, in 1775. At the time of the, the American Revolution, this bridge was being constructed, and the village, which is right beside the bridge today, is nicely called Iron Bridge Village. It was uh, Mr. Wilkinson who 20 years later or so uh, really perfected uh, the use of iron for other than bridges. Uh, he built iron boats, for instance. Uh, he built an iron coffin um, and he took iron and started to bore it instead of casting it for, for cannons, which meant that when the wars against Napoleon um, started in the early 1800s, um, that Britain was a, had an advanced form of bored iron cannons, which lasted longer. 
Thomas Telford in 1793, also in the Midlands in England, uh, decided that to cross valleys, um, they could use an aqueduct. And here is a functioning aqueduct, which goes back to about 1800. And you can see uh, it's a barge being used today to move um, goods. In those days, it would be coal or wood or, or cement from place to place um, using uh, canals. And they were called navigations. And the people who built the canals were called navvies. And this is the oldest surviving aqueduct in Langothlin over the River Dee to Wales. Iron has a limited strength. If you make the iron girders too long, they start to bend when they're under stress. So a much stronger material is based on iron and we call it steel. The very first uh, surviving known uh, steel uh, item was uh, King Porus of Northern Turkey uh, around about uh, the fourth century BC. And he had a steel sword, a very high expense, of course, took a long time to make and other people couldn't copy that. So that was just uh, an early indication of what was to come. The driver for a better quality iron, steel in other words, uh, was the Industrial Revolution. They wanted to build stronger and longer bridges and uh, iron was not good for iron railings, for bridges or for the railways which were going to come along because they wore away too quickly. And the biggest challenge came during the Crimean War when the uh, British artillery were using iron cannons and after so many shots they would start to fail. So the government called on a, um, a researcher called Henry Bessemer, um, shown on the right there, who was based in London, and he was uh, experimenting with removing the weakness of iron, which are impurities, by air blowing the iron when it's molten. And in this Bessemer furnace, which you can see in the top right hand corner, uh, survived all these years, this was one of the original Bessemer furnaces, you could quite cheaply make high quality steel from iron. Andrew Carnegie, this Scotsman, saw this technique and worked with Bessemer and he left to, for a new life in the United States and he ended up in Pittsburgh and he built the first steel mill in the United States. In, uh, he had originally come from Glasgow and the Pittsburgh steel mill started the um, American steel industry. He started to produce very strong girders which were used in the 12 story skyscraper we talked about earlier in Chicago. And by the turn of the century, 1896, the United States steelworks exceeded that produced by Britain. Banknotes, we take them for granted, but where did they come from and why were they used? In ancient times, when you purchased an item, um, you would pay, if you had, them, had it, you'd pay gold or silver or copper uh, coins to buy the item. But in times where these uh, rare metals were short, um, how could we actually promise uh, the person that we're buying from that uh, if we had a paper note that they could come back later and ask for the equivalence in a um, noble metal. And so the first of these paper notes uh, were produced in Tang, China around about 700 AD. And then in Song, China, um, a few hundred years later, the government said, this is a great idea. We don't have to issue or hold gold or silver. We can just issue banknotes. And this is one of the earliest surviving banknotes. And you can see the text at the top describes how much this banknote was worth. Um, it was in common use in the Middle East around about uh, the time of the Crusades. And Marco Polo brought the idea back to Europe from China uh, around about the 13th century. And by the early 1300s, all of the European countries were producing bank notes. But you could only actually get your money out in the form of silver um, if you had a, an account with that particular bank. So that bank, all banks would not honor the same bank notes. So there had to be a step forward. And the Bank of England in 1695 was looking for cash for a war with France again, um, and they earned what we call permanent bank notes where they were pre-printed um, and they could be used by any bank in the country. Um, to make sure that this wasn't uh, counterfeited, each of these bank notes made by the Bank of England had this monetary value written, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner, this is an American version from 1779, but then the amount of currency, $55 is shown there. The bank note was handwritten and look at the bottom of the bank note. Here is the name of the person on the left-hand side who has to hand it over to the bank for it to be changed into silver. 
the Bank of England expand, expanded this concept instead of handwriting on numbers and uh, also the, the actual dollar value or the pound value, they started to make standardization notes uh, from $20, 20 pounds up to a thousand pounds. But still at the bottom was in person's name. <coughs> the United States Bank started to follow the same idea, as I've mentioned. And then finally, the big step forward at the end of the 19th century was the Bank of England issued notes with no name and any bank in the land would have to honor it. And in 1862, the United States federal government followed suit. Up until the development of the train and the steam engine, the fastest that humans could go with it would be a horse and gallop. So um, we're going to lead up to the steps that had to take place before trains could be developed to go faster than horses. We start off with the concept of steam power. And we go back to the Industrial Revolution uh, in the early days, uh, around about 1700, uh, an Englishman, Savary, actually developed a way of using coal to boil water, to make steam, to inject into a cylinder, and then the cylinder would cool, and that cylinder then would condense and pull a piston backwards, and then the process, process would repeat. And this, this oscillating piston could be attached to a pump, and that's how it was first used for pumping water out of a coal mine. But there was a tiny uh, power, only between one and four horsepower, and very unstable and occasionally blow up. It was the English inventor Newcomen who brought steam power into the practical use of uh, manufacturing and pumping. Um, and he expanded the uh, power of, this, of the, his engine to five horsepower. And it's called the beam engine shown on the right hand side. Same concept, um, a steam is injected to a cylinder, the cylinder cools and it pulls down uh, a chain which then pulls up a pump which allows the mine to be emptied out. But it needed lots of coal and was pretty inefficient. Um, but the beginning of pumping out water from coal mines was now a, an economic uh, prospect. The real breakthrough was a Birmingham resident called James Watt. In 1778, he came up with a very ingenious way of getting more power out of the steam that's generated. Very simple concept. Uh, in the cylinder, when the steam had been um, forced into the cylinder, he squirted some water into it that condensed the steam very quickly and made the steam engine much more efficient. And he used Mr. Wilkinson's precision board cylinders to be, make a very effective 10 horsepower engine. And he was able to adapt it to rotary action so it could drive a, an axle and that could power uh, manufacturing items. And it was now available for use in mills. And this is the beginning of the growth from move from the cottage industry to a factory concept. And by 1800, just a few years after he had developed it, there were hundreds and hundreds of these engines throughout England. Now, the trick is to take these engines, which are heavy, cumbersome, vibrate, and need steam um, generation nearby, um, into something that's mobile. And uh, Mr. Trevithick in 1802 um, actually made a high pressure efficient steam engine, which you could then put on um, rollers and put onto a rail, and he could make this thing move along at the very dangerous speed of two and a half miles per hour. And he could move uh, 10 tons of iron and as many people as you wish on his train um, from point A to point B. Very slow. So in 1821, Mr. Stevenson, in England decided to increase the speed of this concept and he designed a brand new um, engine and he called it locomotion number one. And it reached a dizzying speed of 15 miles per hour. And it was used to move coal from Stockton where my grandmother used to live to Darlington, 25 miles. And this was the first practical use of an efficient steam engine. Within seven or eight years, Stevenson had, had made it even more efficient. And this picture on the right hand side was the famous rocket, which was uh, commercially available now to anybody who wanted to move coal or steel or cement or people. And it could travel at up to 40 miles an hour eventually. Now, people in those days believed that if you travel at those horrific speeds, that your body would break down. And in fact, it was Queen. Um, uh, Victoria, who snuck out of the palace one day and hitched a ride on a steam train at this incredible speed of 40 miles an hour, and she came back in one piece and con convinced her husband, Albert, and the rest of the world that steam travel was safe. Now we're going to talk about a naturally occurring uh, force, electricity, um, which eventually will be harnessed during the Industrial Revolution. 
The first people to experiment with the um, concept of electricity was a gentleman called Louis Galvani in Bologna in Italy. And he came to the conclusion that electricity was only produced by living beings. And he called it animal electricity. And to prove this, he got a dead frog and uh, conducted a spark across its um, nerves. And when the electrical spark was connected, the sciatic nerve moved and the frog's legs dead frog, of course, his legs moved. So he was able to convince himself and others that electricity is only a naturally occurring thing. Well, other people disagreed, and Alessandro Volta, working nearby, um, dis disagreed with this concept, and he said he thought it was a chemical process. Um, and uh, he disagreed with Galvani and went off to build the first battery or voltaic pile. And of course, the word Volta then led to us use of voltage in electricity. And in 1799, he invented the first battery. And it's a very crude affair, but very simple. It has silver and zinc discs separated by salt water paper, and the electrons pass from zinc into the salt water paper and then onto the copper. And these movements of electrons produce electricity. And uh, by connecting a positive and a negative pole, you could actually make this work for you. And that is the basis of flashlight batteries today. They haven't changed at all, apart from they're somewhat cheaper, somewhat smaller. And of course, they can be now recharged in the middle, late 19th century. Um, new materials were used that could be recharged. Lead acid battery, for instance, which all cars have today, pretty much. Um, is an example of a uh, voltaic pile, which can be recharged um, after use for many, many times, often in the last four or five years. And the next step, of course, the development of batteries was one where you could actually recharge the battery um, using nickel and cadmium, and those are in common use also. Now we want to harness electricity to do some work for us. And it was Michael Faraday who in 1831 was experimenting and uh, he came across an experiment which stunned him. He took a magnetic field, the outer cylinder shown on the bottom right hand corner, and Michael Faraday introduced into this fixed um, copper coil, another copper coil moving it up and down. As he moved the, the smaller copper coil shown by the hand A, as he moved up and down, so an electrical charge passed through some copper wires into a vacuum jar and a little copper um, slip of paper, slip of copper moved, um, showing that a charge had been produced. And this is called induction. And we use this every day for our toothbrushes and other things. And if you ever wonder um, how that's applied from his early days of the 1830 to modern times, if you put your toothbrush, electric toothbrush, uh, on its base every night to charge up, uh, magically, the next morning is fully charged because the base has a primary coil and the toothbrush in the base of it has a secondary coil and that charges a battery pack and bingo, and it's recharged in a matter of an hour or two. And they're using the same principles of induction that Michael Faraday came up with in 1830. The story of gasoline is one of really a uh, product which nobody wanted. Um, Oil, which has a number of components inside it from bitumen to um, liquid petroleum gases, to kerosene, to gasoline, diesel fuel. It's a mixture of hydrocarbons and it's been on the planet for um, many, many millions of years when um, it formed low down under pressure of rocks and it seeped to the surface and in very many places in the world, like for instance in Iraq and also in the United States, oil came to the surface in small quantities and Native Americans found the oil and used it for medicine. Um, in 1859, Mr. Drake decided that he was going to actually find um, a way to extract this oil commercially rather than wait for it to float to the surface. And he went to a place called Titusville uh, and he built an oil drilling derrick and he drilled 70 feet and he was astonished that um, oil came pouring out of the hole. And for two years, 20 barrels a day of oil were produced. What shall we do with this oil? The main use of the oil was to distill it or refine it. And the product that people wanted in those days was kerosene. Everything else was pretty much discarded. Certainly the naphtha and the gasoline was thrown away. Hard to imagine. So the kerosene was used for kerosene lamps, which would replace candles. 
Um, and of course, you would go down to the local distributor of kerosene, fill up your can, and you'd want to make sure that you got the right amount for the cost per gallon. And uh, Mr. Bowser, Sylvanus Bowser, developed a machine that would actually show buyers that they had got one gallon of kerosene. And that word Bowser is still used for distribution of liquids, 1885. Well, the Brits uh, made a big step forward in what they wanted to use for their fuel for their um, Navy. And previously, the Navy was fired by coal. And they decided that if they could burn diesel fuel, then that would be a much more, or bunker oil, then that would be a much uh, more efficient way of powering their engines to power their huge um, Navy. And, but the problem was Britain at that time did not have any oil. So the explorers went off to the Middle East and sure enough, in 1908, Britain drilled for oil and uh, the Iranian oil fields were established. A few years later, the United States Aramco partners did the same thing in Saudi Arabia and all throughout the Middle East, um, oil wells were being drilled and oil became plentiful. Um, and of course, this oil was owned by the drilling companies like Aramco or BP. Um, and eventually the tables are about to be turned because uh, in the 50s, Iran did the unthinkable uh, move of nationalizing British petroleum. Um, Iraq did the same, Libya, Saudi Arabia and Venezuela all followed suit and they formed a cartel called OPEC who controlled the flow of oil and the price of oil for the rest of the world until the tables were turned yet again when in 2019 the United States became a net exporter of oil and the OPEC cartel became um, less powerful. So now we have found that we can get hydrocarbons from the earth and we know we can use kerosene from crude oil and we know that also makes a byproduct uh, we call naphtha or gasoline. Can we use that? In 1876, a German engineer called Otto designed the first internal gasoline engine, which is basically a steam engine, but instead of using steam power, it burnt um, a type of um, hydrocarbon and it produced three horsepower, but it was fixed, it was heavy. Um, and Carl Benz in 1886 said, if we can make a small, lightweight, compact engine like this, um, then we can attach it to a bicycle. It is a, it is a tricycle, in fact, he started off with. Um, he had a thousand cc capacity and it had one horsepower um, power and he could travel at the a very gentle speed of six miles per hour. So he exhibited this in the area where he worked, um, but people thought that's a nice toy, but it's not really practical for traveling. This all changed forever in 1888, two years later, after he designed this uh, tricycle, which is powered by an internal combustion engine. His wife wanted to visit um, uh, her parents in Mannheim. It was 66 miles, and she thought, I'm going to see if this device that my husband developed will actually travel in a decent amount of time. Um, and off she went and she covered the 66 miles in one day. But of course, the big issue was breakdowns, which had to be repaired on the way, um, and also refueling, which we got from pharmacies on the way. She bought naphtha, which was a type of solvent in those days. But this kind of engine could burn any light hydrocarbon. When she came back, people heard of the astonishing journey of traveling 66 miles in one day in a carriage and uh, led to the first sale. And from then onwards, the motor car was up and running. 1896 in the United States, Ford produced his first car and he used ethanol um, and it traveled at 20 miles an hour. And uh, by the turn of the century, cars were becoming more common on the roads in America and Europe, but they were considered expensive and unreliable and more, more toy-like than actually a means of transport. Until six years later, he made a big breakthrough. He developed a car for the people. Um, he did it by having only one color, very little frills, no water or gas pumps, um, and uh, people worked on the assembly line. And that way he's able to do what we call today, which is mass production and allowed uh, the factory to produce a very efficient number of 150 cars per hour. This was a huge breakthrough. With the assets uh, producing so many saleable cars, of course, he could keep his price down. And in modern terms, a Model T Ford in today's money would only cost $18,000, which compared to the average selling price of a car in America of around $40,000 is a very good deal indeed. Um, by 1912, 
Cars outnumbered carriages in the major cities in America, and the last horse drawn streetcar was in 1917. Electric cars have been around for the same amount of time, um, and the Bailey Electric Car Company was the biggest manufacturer of electric cars for about six years. Um, cost was very modest, $2,000, and it ran on batteries, and it could do 20 miles per hour. And this picture of Thomas Edison and Mr. Bailey showed that he traveled 1,000 miles from east to west um, using Thomas Edison's new nickel iron batteries. And interestingly, they were able to get 100 miles per charge, which is very, very impressive, considering that is over 100 years ago. Keeping the subject of Mr. Edison going, we now move on to one of his most famous uh, discoveries, the light bulb. Only we're going to find out very shortly, it wasn't his discovery. The search for an electrically powered illumination lamp had been going on for a long time. Uh, Davy uh, developed a discharge light connecting two high voltage terminals, which gave a very bright white light and a spark. Um, but it wasn't consistently uh, or mellow in terms of color enough to, to read by. And then in 1841, uh, English uh, inventors de developed a patent for using a vacuum bulb um, with a platinum coil inside connected to um, power, electricity, um, and the uh, platinum coil glowed uh, red hot and that produced light. Um, it was very expensive being platinum, of course, and the Russians were then experimenting with using carbon and not vacuum, but using nitrogen to stop the, um, the filament burning out too quickly. And in 1875, uh, Mr. Swan in Britain came up with a brilliant idea of using a carbon filament, which would last longer, although it did smoke a bit. And so it had a limited life. Um, uh, and in February 79, he made a big spring forward and he used carbonized cotton in a vacuum bulb and it worked. But sadly, Mr. Swan was so busy experimenting, he didn't bother to patent it until too late. And stories of Mr. Swan's light bulb passed across to the United States. And Edison had been working on light bulbs around the same time and he'd failed consistently because he couldn't get a filament that would last long enough. And one night he was getting uh, down because he couldn't find a filament that would work. It was inexpensive. And he was sitting in his lab all alone, rubbing a piece of carbon black between his fingers. And then suddenly he realized maybe this string of carbon black could be turned into a filament uh, in the form of a slender thread. And he did have success. He, in 1879, uh, in October, Around the same time as Swan had already developed his bulb, um, he produced the Edison light bulb, which lasted for, wait for it, 14 hours, which of course is not commercial. And then he tried to carbonize bamboo and he got better and better at making filaments until eventually that year, he could produce a light bulb that would last for a hundred days, which was a very commercial proposition. People could not believe it. And they crowded into his laboratories in Menlo Park. And that's where he got the name, the Wizard of Menlo Park. And we now consider that it was Edison who developed the first practical commercial light bulb. Flight has been um, of interest to humans for thousands and thousands of years. Leonardo da Vinci did many sketches of birds' wings, trying to understand what it is that allowed them to fly and move and stay above gravity problems. But it was George Cayley in 1792 who really started the concept of modern flight. He is often called the father of aviation because he came up with the understanding of why birds can stay up in the air and can move forward. And he came up with the four laws of aviation, that everything that flies has weight. Um, and to compensate for that weight, you have to have lift. As you move forward, you produce drag. Therefore, you have to have thrust to push you through the air. And those four laws are the fundamentals of aviation today. And he made a curved wing, um, which actually showed that this concept of uh, lift could be developed by having the right shape wings, wings, which Leonardo and George had actually seen in seagulls. And so he made in 1804 a wing um, glider, uh, which allowed him to have stabilizers and a rudder. And he had the he's considered to be the first person to have a controlled glider in uh, the early 19th century. Um, by the end of that century, a German Otto Lilienthal had developed this um, glider to a more sophisticated, lighter weight 
um, device and uh, he enjoyed going up the top of small hills and launching himself and uh, some passers-by took a photograph of him just before he crashed and died. The photograph crossed the Atlantic and was very eagerly received by two brothers in Ohio who had opened a cycle shop and we know them of course as the Wright brothers and they thought this can be done we can make it better and so they made a glider that could actually fly um, through 400 feet um, and they took it in 1902 to Kitty Hawk in North Carolina and uh, they test flighted the test flew that glider and they realized it was strong enough to apply the next step which was attach it, attach an engine to it to give it propulsion and in 1903 in December the 17th they took their first uh, plane with a 12 horsepower engine that they had developed themselves made out of an aluminum because uh, anything, anything made out of iron or steel would have been too heavy but even so the engine weighed the same as a uh, man 180 pounds so they're adding a lot of weight to their plane but it flew it was the first powered sustained and controlled flight um, and they get the recognition for that although of course it was only 120 feet before it stopped it lasted 12 seconds it never went over six miles per hour and didn't rise above 10 foot but it was the first controlled flight this of course was staggeringly successful and people realized that uh, they could build on this and they sold their first plane a few years later equivalent to about seven hundred thousand dollars today one of the main challenges for communication is that once you get uh, far enough away from another person, you can't hear them talk. But how do you communicate over long distances? And this is a picture of a reconstructed telegraph system, which was developed by the Greeks. And it's called the hydraulic telegraph. And the Greeks used it uh, in the time of Alexander to communicate um, across battlefield. But of course, they could only communicate pre-written messages which were on a stick and the soldier would wave a torch. The receiving station would see the torch being waved. Both would pull the cork out of the cylinder, which was full of water, and the shaft with the messages attached to it would sink until the sender would realize they'd got the message that he wanted. Um, and then he put the plug in, back in the cylinder, and waved his torch one more time, and the other receiver across the battlefield did the same and he read the message and it would say attack or retreat or take left flank. And so very simple communications could be made long distances. And uh, the Roman uh, um, historian Polybius um, mentioned it was used extensively around about the time of 200 BC against Carthage. The next stage, of course, was to not just have pre-recorded messages, but make up messages during the middle of the battlefield. And they moved on to two torches and they used a simple alphabetic code where um, one torch in his left hand would tell you which row he's talking about. And then the right hand would have another torch and that would say how far down the columns. And so uh, two and two would mean letter G. And so you could clumsily write whole sentences to commanders in the battlefield. We then jump a long way forward to 1815, where Samuel Morse, who is a very well-known painter, this picture of John Adam, the president, was painted by him. And uh, he was remote from his wife, and four days after she died, he received a hand-carried letter which said that he had passed, she'd passed away. He was distraught, and he said, there must be a way of communicating long distances that are faster than letters. And so he read about electromagnetism, and he began to experiment with transmission of electrical signals. At the same time, uh, an Englishman, a guy called Cook, um, had beaten him to the punch to some extent, and he'd already produced um, a telegraph system which could actually transmit information um, 12 miles between stations, although they had to have battery boosters to boost the power um, to cover such a long distance. So then Morse copied that and he built his equivalent in New Jersey, which was two miles long. But these were very limited in that they could only transmit numbers. And so the next step forward was Cook then developed a system with three copper wires but um, and that was able to transmit letters and numbers, and that was a big step forward. And of course, Morse then made it even simpler because he converted all letters into a short 
touch of the sender, which would be a dot, and a longer contact, which would be a dash. And so he was able to print out on ticker tape um, all of the English alphabet. And for instance, A is a dot and a dash, B is a dash, dot, dot, dot. And this is still used in difficult uh, circumstances to communicate um, in, uh, in warfare. In 1844, um, Morse managed to construct a telegraph which is 44 miles long and uh, it was that is stretched from DC to Baltimore um, and uh, eventually uh, Morse developed a single wire system which became the world standard and can transmit letters and numbers um, from long distances. So if we now want to find out how we moved from the telegraph in the late 19th century to much more interesting and very commonly used item today, the telephone, we'll have to come back and then we'll cover part two of technological advantages that change the world. This is Adrian Kerr signing off. Thank you.